Here I am. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. You know, that last item on chat there suggested you shave your head on the call next week, and I would second that. There. Uh, hello, it. friends, old and new. Welcome. Uh, my name is Monty Paulson. I lead the Passive House team at RDH Building Science. I'm honored to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's Passive House Happy Hour Call hosted by the Passive House Accelerator. This is an inclusive gathering. We welcome people from all Passive House communities as well as Living Building, Net Zero, and others working to create zero emission buildings with radically lower embodied carbon. So please turn on your cameras. We'd like to see you. Please turn on your microphones just briefly for and join me in raising a glass to a toast and let's say to coronavirus, coronavirus and global chaos, chaos say it all together now nanny nanny nana nanny 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 cheers we've survived another week let's enjoy it cheers so now turn down your microphones please close your email browser or your web browser um, because we have a great lineup this evening. We have a short video about the Clayton Heights Community Center here in Surrey, British Columbia. Uh, the video is by Integral Group, which has provided a great mechanical solutions to a bunch of early pass house projects. And after that, we have a presentation about a fantastic project that is on track to be North America's largest certified Enerfit retrofit. This is the Ken Sobel Tower in Hamilton, Ontario. And that presentation is live by Yale Santopino and Graham Stewart of ERA Architects. Now, let me introduce my co-host, Prudence Ferreira. Thanks, Monty. Um, as Monty said, welcome everyone. If you're new to the happy hour, we are so happy to have you. You've come to the right place for, uh, for fun facts and hearing about it all quickly so that we can get the fun social part. Um, I am uh, the leader of the Passive House Practice at Morrison Hirschfield, and I'm happy to uh, ask again for you all to send in your videos. We've gotten a lot of videos uh, that have come and all different kinds. Tonight, we're actually going to be seeing an animation. So uh, filming with your cell phone isn't the only way to do it. Um, Tonight's two minute video, as Monty mentions, by Integral Group and shout out to Tyler Disney who created the incredible animations to highlight the uh, community center, its passive house principles and the systems in it. Um, this is the largest passive house building in Canada yet. Um, and I want to just give a congratulations to HCMA Architecture, who worked on it, Integral Group, who did uh, mechanical electrical plumbing, Ellis Dawn, the construction manager, and my own Morrison Hirschfield, who was the building envelope consultant and uh, tested the building out with a blower door result of 0 0.06 ACH50. Yeah, you heard it right. All right, without further ado, let's have a look. Clayton Community Center is North America's first passive house community center, as well as Canada's largest passive house facility to date. Because it is being constructed to passive house standards, Clayton will consume up to 90% less energy compared to baseline. But what does passive house mean? Passive house design relies on five principles, super insulated envelopes, airtight construction, high performance glazing, a thermal bridge free envelope, and heat recovery ventilation. Designing Canada's largest passive house project to date posed several challenges that were overcome with good design practices. The building was oriented and programmed in harmony with the path of the sun and seasons. As a community center with higher internal loads, the Clayton design team had to get extra creative to meet passive house energy use requirements. They found that only with a natural ventilation strategy could they get to passive house standard energy use requirements. Automated windows in the facade and clear stories allow Clayton to naturally ventilate the space when conditions are right. During summer nights, the control system opens the windows and performs a night flush cooling the thermal mass of the building with fresh outside air. The natural ventilation strategy allows up to a 65% reduction in cooling energy while using 100% outside air with no air recirculation. 
Low-speed, high-volume ceiling fans maintain a comfortable breeze in the highest load spaces. Custom radiant ceiling panels integrated into the structure provide heating or cooling as required. Underfloor air distribution provides premium displacement ventilation in the library space. Through a combination of good orientation, envelope design, active mechanical system design, and passive natural ventilation, Clayton sets a new precedent for sustainability and user experience in North American community centers. Right on. Thank you, Integral Group. That's awesome. And I know that uh, a number of, of uh, team members from that project are on uh, this call. So if you have questions generated by that video, feel free to, to share them in chat or to, uh, to pose them during the Q&A session um, later in the call. So now we're going to switch to uh, breakout rooms. So we're going to do a rapid fire introduction, just three minutes. So um, just uh, introduce yourself and keep it quick so that we can get around to, to, to everyone. And welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some, some uh, announcements now. Um, and the first one is that we have the Building Science and Beer Show tomorrow. Uh, the topic is, do you need a vapor barrier? And uh, the, uh, it'll be tomorrow at 3 PM Pacific, 6 PM Eastern. I'll share these links in chat. And once I'm done with the announcements, there's also a, a BS Friday that I think happens monthly, and they're getting getting lots of. I think I think Mark mentioned a thousand people came through the last one uh, in May. Um, the the mysterious title is the Red Door of Truth delivered by the third party. I think that people may have some guesses as to what that is. 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern on Friday. Uh, the International Passive House Association has its community meetup coming up, and this one will be. Uh, with Dimitris from, from Athens about the Passive House Student Competition in Greece. Uh, that'll be June 15th, 9 p.m. Central European time. Um, and there are details there in that link. We're launching a Manufacturer Friday. Um, and the first one we're gonna be doing is with Mitsubishi Electric. And that's gonna be next Friday, June 19th um, at 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. And it'll be a, a brief presentation about what Mitsubishi has coming up for multifamily and commercial projects. So they've got some cool new equipment. Um, so this is, your, uh, this is a good chance to, to um, hear a brief presentation about that and ask questions of Mitsubishi about how that equipment might apply to your project. So um, there's a, a link there. We're pretty excited about that. NAPHN is about to start its virtual conference, Passive House 2020. And uh, that's gonna be happening on Wednesday afternoons, Eastern time. Uh, for six Wednesdays starting June 24th and, and ending July 29th. And the opening plenary is coming up. So please uh, it's, uh, visit that link to, to uh, register. It's called the opening is now what? An opening plenary keynote and discussion. Um, and it's with Dan Heath, uh, the author of Switch, as well as uh, Bronwyn Berry, who's on the call now, and Wolfgang Feist. Uh, and back by popular demand, Monty Paulson's course Pattern language from Passive House uh, will be um, offered two more times. So two uh, uh, series. The first, the the coming, the one that's coming up soonest is July seventh through sixteenth. There's also a series coming up September eighth through 29th. and you can go to Zebex uh, for details. And finally, I want to thank our founding sponsors who make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible, make this call possible. Mitsubishi Electric, Zola Windows and RDH Building Science, as well as our patron sponsors, Morrison Hirschfield and 475 High Performance Building Supply. Thank you. So I think we're back to Monty now. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. Just what, just checking, thanks. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. I, I, I'm, I'm still stunned by the excitement to see that Mitsubishi has a CO2 heat pump. That got me excited and distracted there for a moment. <laughs> um, so by way of introduction, of our future presentation, I wanna share just a little moment of Canadian Passive House history. Way back in 2009, my neighbors and I elected a mayor and a slate of city councilors who promised to make Vancouver the greenest city in the world, whatever that meant. They campaigned on it, they won, everybody was really excited. And once they got into office, they realized they needed a policy tool by which a cash strapped and information starved city government could evaluate and incentivize zero energy buildings. And like, 
many newly elected groups. There was a period of a few months when they were going to invent their own Vancouver building standard, and there were these meetings and all these excitements, and then they realized how truly the world did not need yet another green building standard. But their problem was how do they create value, uh, incentivize the right things without falling into some big boondoggle. Coincidentally, at the exact same time, a group of Austrians were erecting a television studio in Whistler from which the Austrian National TV Network was gonna broadcast the 2010 Winter Games. And this tiny demonstration house was Canada's first certified passive house. And it was this great little pilot project. And within a few months, uh, several of us, Guido Vimbers, uh, myself, on get uh, the key just policy makers and politicians at the city to come up to Whistler, take a look at the Austria house. And they realized, wow, the thing they were looking for already existed. There was this great standard. There were these tools. There were thousands of buildings around the world already built to it. All they needed to do was to figure out kind of how it fit within their policy framework. And they spent the next couple of years working on that. And to some degree, the success of Passive House in the city of Vancouver owes a huge debt of gratitude to that one little 2,200 square foot pilot project uh, built by some Austrian manufacturers. So let's fast forward to this endless summer of 2020. At this moment, our federal government here in Ottawa is looking for policy tools that will enable them to responsibly invest billions of dollars in a green stimulus program. Read any journal, read any news site, you'll see pundits and policy wonks debating kind of what's the best way to approach green stimulus without falling into boondoggles. And in a little working class city just outside Toronto, Hamilton City Housing is retrofitting the Ken Sobel Tower to the passive house retrofit standard, affectionately known as Enerfit. Side note, avoid letting German physicists do your marketing and naming your things for you. So nonetheless, this is largely to be the, is gonna be the world's largest or at least North America's largest Enerfit retrofit. And at this extraordinary coincidence in timing, I think this project, the Ken Sobel Tower could serve a role the way the Austria House did in 2009 of being the seminal deep energy retrofit project that allows many policymakers to say, hey, we can actually do this. This exists. This works. And so I'm tremendously honored to welcome uh, Yale Santopino and Graham Stewart of Area Architects to the Past House Happy Hour. Oh, well, thanks so much, Monty. That's a fabulous introduction. <clears throat> So, so off we go. So um, my name is Graham Stewart. I'm a, a principal at the Area Architects and we've been working on the Ken Sobel Tower with uh, City Housing Hamilton uh, since 2017. So from, from feasibility onwards. So I'll share my screen and we'll dive right into it. All right, can everyone see that? Excellent. And first of all, thanks so much for having us as our first, this is our maiden voyage to this group and it's uh, with the breakout rooms and everyone and looking at the schedules of the last meetings, we'll definitely be back. So this is, this is fabulous. So this is the Ken Sobel Tower. So this, uh, our office, ERA, uh, we focus on retrofits. So we do retrofits of all types. Um, and uh, the part of the practice that uh, Yael and I are involved in is looking a lot at housing and affordable housing. And this problem of what do we do with the aging affordable housing stock? Um, we, we work on that in many different ways, but sort of the stars aligned where one of the workshops that we were hosting that included several municipalities, included representatives from City Housing Hamilton, which is their social housing group. Um, and they said, you know what, how do, how do we work together to be able to, to realize something special at the Ken Sobel Tower? So the... Um, so this is the project. So the, the idea that it would be an interfit project, you know all the details about what Passive House can achieve, um, but this is a very aging asset. So this, this building was uh, developed in 1967, uh, was sort of in Canada, a centennial project, um, you know, a, a public investment to start to transform Hamilton, uh, part of which happened all over the country of building affordable housing. Um, and uh, Hamilton housing is pretty remarkable in that they have some pretty ambitious goals where all new social housing that they're developing, they want it to meet, meet uh, Passive House standard. Um, in Eastern Canada, uh, Hamilton is actually the leader in Passive House building. Uh, in Western Canada, it's obviously Vancouver. Um, but, but in Eastern Canada, uh, uh, Hamilton, which is a city of about 700,000 as part of Greater Toronto, um, has an amazing track record. And uh, this, this uh, housing company is, is really leading the way. So when the Ken Sobel Tower came up for refurbishment, this is a photograph of it in 1967 when it opened. Um, this is a, a, in, uh, in January, uh, mid-construction. Um, 
they said, why don't we apply these same principles um, to, to a retrofit project? And to get the funding and to get the mandate from city council to go with this, uh, this new build uh, passive house regime, they had to make all the arguments about the long-term benefits and the health benefits and everything else. And so the, 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 the deck was stacked to try something with an existing building. So working in existing buildings and complex buildings is something that we're, we're deeply familiar with. And when you go into a building like this, it's kind of like going into a cruise ship. You know, you're looking at all of the, all the guts and all the parts of the building that are hidden. Um, and mainly this project was a, an asset renewal. How do you take this building and give it another 30 years of life? And you're dealing with all of the, the hidden things, the, the chases, the, um, you know, the plumbing stacks and, and the bulk of the budget is actually asset renewal. And when you look at the assessment of how much is it is towards passive house versus just what you do anyway, um, the delta for passive house is pretty small. This is the, it was also a federally funded program. So part of this is we had to put all these pitch documents together and get funding from different sources. Um, and this is just when, as Monty mentioned, the, the federal government released a new program to do deep retrofits for existing housing. And it had several requirements. One is deep affordability, which this, this satisfies because it's public housing, but also um, a big accessibility program. So 20% of the units are being retrofitted as barrier free, as long as, as well as all the public spaces. Um, and it had energy performance requirements, which we we address with passive house so well well surpassed the base minimums this is looking at a floor plan and how we had to do a lot of maneuvering to, to make the um, barrier free work um, and then elsewhere there's sort of a you know a social program and, and, and uh, community programming it's a seniors building that goes into this so this is this is the, the reprogramming reworking importantly it's, it's good to understand this building was empty um, when we when we went into it because it was in such bad shape that they had to move people out and this is some of the visuals of the, uh, the after the captivating renderings but really when we look at this the reason we were so thrilled they went with the passive house standard is that we all know you can make a low energy building that's terrible to live in but because passive house is embedded with a lot of pieces of the european and german building codes it's actually about tenant comfort and we're also looking at life safety adding sprinklers and looking at it holistically and not just in terms of kilowatt hours on their own so this is when we entered the, the, the premises and did the assessment. So lots of issues. There was embedded mold in the walls, there was, uh, which we found uh, midstream. Uh, there was uh, 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 holes between the, the firewalls, between units that were never properly done. There was everything that could go wrong with the building was, was wrong here. So it's effectively a gut job in many of uh, the issues. And this is what the after looks like. So the robust envelope that we know is part of Passive House, triple glazed windows from a manufacturer in BC called Cascadia. Um, a uh, cooling strategy, which we'll get into, you know, new fit out, um, and importantly, uh, you know, a way to do natural and passive ventilation as well as active ventilation, both heating and cooling. And this is what the unit looks like when you have to do the barrier free, which is quite a lot more fit out, and to be able to do that and look at where, uh, where the fresh air supply is and how it all works. So fresh air supply. So one of the things we know about these older buildings is that the way that they provided fresh air just doesn't work anymore. Uh, and this isn't recommended anymore. It was just a corridor pressurization um, and then door undercuts to, to do it. So of course, everyone had filled the bottom of their doors with newspapers or, or other things and, the, and, and even most of the fans weren't even working. So no fresh air was getting into this building unless you opened up the window. Uh, and the kilowatt hours of this per square meter when we started was um, over 350. Um, so what we did is we worked with the existing risers and were able on a floor by floor basis to provide um, fresh air supply by doing direct ducting in the corridor and then putting that into each unit. Um, and then centrally we're providing, um, obviously the heat loads have gone way down, so it's centrally provided heating, but then for comfort we've got a VAV booster um, electric uh, sort of in each unit for people to be able to control it. Um, and heat recovery um, uh, top and bottom. And so this was looking at with, within that modeling for comfort. And we worked with TransSolar as one of our partners to do that and JMV Consulting. And um, cooling became the real issue. And cooling became the issue because obviously this building will be easy to heat. Um, but we also modeled this based on 2050 climate data. What will the Toronto region be like in 2050? It's a little bit more like Washington DC with the he increasing humid summers. So we had a five stage uh, passive to active cooling, um, you know, ceiling fans, operable windows, large operable uh, Juliets here, um, but also um, central dehumidification and central act, uh, active cooling, not quite AC, but it would get you to about 25 degrees on a really hot day. Um, 
and looking at this, we did a lot of modeling to say, as you get to, as you get to this, how do you um, mitigate uh, in the future temperatures? And we were, we were within that zone, but a lot of the testing will, will get us there. And finally, for a resilience measure, this is looking at a cold day. What this is looking at is the power goes out on the coldest day in February. How long does it take till you have to evacuate the building? So the blue is an Ontario building code building. That would be within one day, the bylaws would say you'd have to evacuate that building. This building could last four to five days, which is a real sort of sell in the long-term benefits. And now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, uh, Yael, who will take it from here. Great, thanks, Karen. I'll just speak briefly the last five or so minutes about the facade approach. Um, so we were tasked with obviously the Enerfit targets around air tightness and uh, insulation, but we also were tasked by our client to have a low carbon, uh, non-combustible insulation approach and non-combustible non materials. So next slide. Um, this was on top of really some poor conditions on the envelope. We were dealing with spalling brick, thermal bridging at slabs, which is very typical of this vintage of building, and a very poor interior condition. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a view of what that looked like. Next slide. Uh, so our initial design, we came into this and we said, okay, we're going to solve this. We're going to keep the interiors of uh, interior finishes. We're going to solve this from the exterior and develop this double wall assembly with a fluid applied air barrier, 10 inches of mineral wool insulation and, and, um, and you know, a sort of exterior mounted window. Next slide. Um, but in fact, uh, we were met with sort of our site conditions. So concealed mold was found inside the interior uh, finishes of the exterior walls. And we realized that in an airtight building that had to be addressed. Next slide. So the assembly, we, we actually came up with an assembly which was much more traditional. So, you know, four inches of insulation on the interior, uh, our fluid applied air barrier and insulation on the exterior with an EVES finish. Um, and in fact, while this was a lot more work, the trade pricing told us the story that more familiar assemblies are always going to be cheaper. So that was our learning. Next one. Um, a little bit here about the windows. So as Graham mentioned, we worked with a triple glaze passive house certified window from Cascadia out of BC. Um, because we knew our building's rough openings were in terrible condition, uh, and because we wanted to bring the windows out to the warm to, inside the insulation, we actually mounted them on fiberglass clips. And here you see the studies we did to understand, could we use steel uh, angles? Uh, rather than fiberglass angles to kind of uh, to kind of make those windows work, but ultimately uh, we found that that fiberglass was what was required. Uh, and this is what that looks like installed. So you can see the fluid applied air barrier on top of the brick. That's the gray backing there. And then what we used here were silicone transition strips rather than finicky tapes. So you can see how that's coming together with the fiberglass angle down at the bottom. Next slide. Uh, one thing we wanted to be able to touch on here was thermal bridging through balconies. So balconies are a huge problem in buildings of this vintage. Um, and we looked at a number of options, in, in close, including enclosing them, wrapping them, and other things. Ultimately, a cost-driven decision and an operational decision was made to remove them and replace them with Juliet's, which is what we're doing. Next slide. Uh, air tightness testing. So this is obviously a high risk venture in a building that's so large. So what we wanted to do is build into this to the specifications a phased testing plan, where which draws from uh, from the scale of the mock up up to several full floor guarded tests and then our final building mock up. And what we did here that we were glad we did is a baseline test before we started construction to understand how leaky this building actually was. Uh, next slide. Uh, it was about 3.86 air changes per hour. Um, last, last thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, this brought on a whole, this, this project meant we had to take on a whole new set of um, responsibilities. And one of the things we did was building uh, the RFP for the CM. We built the, the section on the air boss role, which is a role performed by the, uh, the construction manager in this case that involves testing of trades on site. Whoever comes in new on site in a key trade has to undergo some kind of uh, orientation on Passive House, uh, pe maintaining penetrations log, a really rigorous QA, QC um, program. And so this was, this was for us a big learning and we're glad we have it, um, that we were able to develop this and build that into the project. 
uh, you know we're running up on time and just the next slide here runs us through a couple photos. This is as we're starting to do uh, demolition. Next slide. Uh, and this is now the building as you see windows going in, air barrier on the building. Uh, and so the construction is slated to be complete in early 2021. Next slide. Uh, yeah, more, more windows going in. And then the, the one thing we wanted to mention before we wrap here is that, um, you know, passive house certification doesn't require us to tell, to tell ourselves, did we actually make this work uh, post occupancy? Um, but this is something that we're a longitudinal study that we're going to be undertaking through the University of Toronto, funded by the federal government to understand, did we meet our comfort targets? Did we meet our resilience targets? What about social sustainability? How has uh, um, how is this building uh, retrofit actually had an impact on people living in the building on the social, economic, and environmental sides? So you can look forward to that, uh, hopefully to be published in a couple of years. That's All it right. for and that's it awesome. for us. Thank you very much. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank that was you. very quickly done. Hey, so I want to just share our, our plan for questions and then some further discussion tonight. Um, we thought we'd take questions and comments on the building itself for a little while, half an hour, 20 minutes. And then either at the end of this hour, or at the beginning of the after party hour, uh, Graham is going to share a little more about the policy approach to these buildings generally and um, maybe talk about where this policy could go a little bit. Does that Am I understanding that right, Rick Graham? Yeah, no, I think um, we both will be jumping into that. So. <laughs> great, great. Um, and I would just add, on the call today, I see Chris Ballard, CEO of Pass House Canada is here, who I know has been engaged. He's a former MP. He's been engaged in discussions about where policy in Canada might go around deep energy retrofits. It's obviously a really complicated discussion, but a critically timed discussion this year. Also, um, Bronwyn Berry from NAPHN, which is engaged in some of those same kind of conversations in the state. So we'd love to hear your comments, thoughts, suggestions. And if you have any magic ideas about policy or political levers, those are welcome too. Do you have anything queued up, Sean? I do. Uh, Tony Phillips, you were up next. Hopefully you got my note. You had two questions. Go ahead and start us off. I meant Tom Phillips, not Tony. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Phillips around. Oh, yeah, no worries. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, I was glad to see that they did the um, power outage thing with some future climate data. But, um, and I'm guessing that they also did it with, uh, during a heat wave, they only showed the cold weather data. And uh, so, I'd, you know, like to see that at some point. And then also, did they use extreme weather files? Uh, rather than typical weather files to, to capture more of the, um, you know, the thermal stress problems because they tend to be dampened when you just use typical weather files. Of course, for future climate, I guess for future climate, you only have one set of weather files, so. Sure, yeah. So to answer that, yeah, future climate, we, did, we, yeah, we used the 2050 projected temperatures. Um, we also used extreme temperatures in today's climate. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. Um, the, we, didn't, we didn't show you the analysis done on, on, a, when, when the, uh, on an extreme heat day. We showed you the extreme cold. It didn't perform quite as dramatically better as an OBC, as a code building, but it did perform better. And um, are you thinking of looking at late century too? So this building should last quite a while, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's the next horizon, 2080. So Tom, did you get your second question in there too? Uh, I think that was it. Uh, well, I guess I always ask about shading. Where's the goddamn shading? You know? <laughs> All right, you go ahead and ask shading and then we'll go to the next one. <laughs> yeah. So what, what did you do? What did you uh, do in terms of shading? tackle that one. The, um, no, a great question. So the first thing about this building is because of the type it was, the window to wall ratio is tiny. So it's about between 17 and 18%. So already you've got, it already like beat the, the standard just by the way it was built. So it wasn't as though we had these huge expanses of glass that we had to then build a shading strategy for. Um, but we did want to do the sort of typical, you know, German exterior roller blinds, um, which you can kind of buy at the equivalent of Home Depot in Germany. But um, uh, this is a question that Monty asked before as well. But in terms of finding an installer, finding a supplier, finding someone who do a warranty, et cetera, et cetera, 
that all of the, the local market where people have done a couple of these in, in Hamilton and these smaller projects, they found that as soon as they had a technical failure or dispute with the trade, it just, it just, you know, the price escalated and half of them they don't even use anymore. And this is a perfect example of a really simple product that is, it is not rocket science. This is, this is just basic building construction in middle Europe that is rocket science in North America because of supply chain and training. Um, so we use blackout blinds on the interior. Um, and, uh, but the, the main benefit we had is we, the model showed we didn't necessarily need um, shading if we had the active cooling. We really wanted to keep the shading to see if we can operate the building without the active cooling, but um, because of the window wall ratio, we were in good shape. Okay, great stuff. Caleb uh, Crawford, do you want to come on and ask your question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hey, uh, I was curious because uh, in, in, in New York, uh, one of the big problems with these brick clad buildings is that they're uh, shelf angles that are supported or they're supported on the slab and the tiebacks uh, to the, um, the underlying structural masonry behind, you know, that, that those things can go over time. So I was surprised to see you clad directly on top of the, the existing brick and whether there was a substantial, whether you did like, you know, because I think you said that you were doing um, uh, a mineral edifice, is that correct? Or did you not? Yeah. Which is a fair amount of weight. It is, yeah, it is. So, uh, good question. So, we certainly work on buildings of this vintage where you see that the shelf angles uh, were actually, you know, missing where they should be there. So, one of the first <laughs> things we did at, at, at this building was actually do a bunch of destructive investigations, localized, to understand uh, where you had continuous brick wall, which is the minority of areas in this building where they properly tied back and where they were sitting on slab, where they, where they, um, were they secure enough? We also did pull, te pull out testing on the bricks. So we did a lot of uh, uh, sort of structural investigation on that assembly to ensure it could take the loads. Um, and in, yeah, and so you're correct. It's a mineral, it's right now the exterior is a six inch mineral wool uh, EFIS system. And would you have preferred to take off the brick and get down to the CMU or, you know, I mean, cost wise, it's a, it's a chunk of change, but. Would you have felt like you would have been gotten more longevity out of it? Graham, why don't you speak to that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, what we found is that where the, the main reason that a lot of people are investing in envelope is because of everything you're mentioning is deteriorating bricks and, and water penetration. Um, and so, as Yale was mentioning, luckily this building was actually in quite phenomenal shape in terms of its envelope as compared to other ones that we've worked on. Um, but even if it was in not terrible shape, the, the, or if it was in terrible shape, um, stabilizing it and then covering it up means you actually don't need to do a lot of that remediation work. So instead of doing clean repairs, um, you're able to use helical ties or other things to stabilize the, the masonry. And also it's, it's generally a, a compound system. So it's the way that the bricks are keyed into the block um, at certain zones, which creates some of the, the rigidity. Um, oh. we, we'd actually be worried about delaminating the brick course because the stability of the, the block on its own is suspect in some locations. So, um, mm. um, so keeping it all there is, is, is better. <laughs> cool. And great, great stuff. And there's lots of great questions. And so doing my best to keep it going. Um, sorry, Damien uh, in Melbourne. Yeah, I just wanted to the, um uh, very interested in the fiberglass surrounds, but uh, how did the fiberglass fit with the flame proof? Oh, sure. So I'll speak to that. Um, yeah. So the um, <clears throat> the windows or the or and and also the supports. Uh, so the um, the windows. Uh, met our requirements in the building code for sufficient spacing between windows, except at at the locations where we had balconies. And so fiberglass windows in this application um, just have become permitted under our national model building code. And we, we applied here for an alternative solution to allow for it. The fiberglass supports were permitted because they were a component within the envelope. Hey. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is a really big uh, uh, moment in Canada where fiberglass is gonna be yeah. permitted now in these applications. 
can I just add a really briefly to that? I have actually seen some of the fire tests on some of those fiberglass windows. And I really think it's just a matter of time for the code officials to see the actual data. In real flame tests, the fiberglass windows, you know, slowly let go, but they don't let go of the panel anywhere nearly as quickly as the aluminum around huge plastic spacer windows do, where the plastic melts and the IGU and the thing comes off quickly. Uh, and so our sense is that there's a bit of a, uh, an educational process and Cascadia and others have been leading that effort somewhat. Um, but the more people look at it, they're gonna actually come to prefer fiberglass um, for durability in both extreme hot and extreme cold conditions. Yeah, I mean, you've got no problem with glass fiber, but uh, uh, the resins that are used are going to be problematic. And certainly if you're heading for, uh, zero carbon or, or reduced carbon, embedded carbon, and uh, non-toxics, it strikes me as being a little challenging. Oh, that, that's a good point. And the one thing that we, we do want to mention is that the in, in the Canadian context, the sort of typical cheap overcladding people use is an EFIS system with EPS. And it was our, you know, it was our opinion, but thankfully the owner agreed that uh, going with the rock wool, even though the trades aren't as used to it and there's a bit of a uh, price premium, uh, the idea that it is, it's, an autumn, it's a non-petroleum product and the embedded energy is, is a fraction of what you get with EPS. So you, you may be correct with the, uh, the resins in the windows, but we're quite happy that we, it was quite a fight actually to get to a, a rock wool um, overcladding uh, over uh, solution versus the typical. But of course, um, uh, you know, the potential flame spread of, of, uh, of EPS was a big part of that decision too. Great stuff, guys. And uh, Susan, had you up next. Yes, you, okay. Susan. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of Susan. Up. Yeah, well, it was about, you were mentioning all about um, how the University of Toronto is going to be commissioning a study to follow up on the comfort of the, uh, the occupant comfort. I'm just curious if uh, there was any um, studies that were done prior to this whole renovation starting, if there was a baseline of tenant comfort taken into account? Uh, I'm just yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, we wish we had more. We did, we did have um, information from some informal interviews, but it's, it wasn't the kind of before and after that we'd want to have a rigorous study. Instead, what we're, going to be do, what we're going to be doing with the University of Toronto is actually taking a similar building because the um, City Housing Hamilton has many buildings of this vintage, mm -hmm. similar building, which is also um, a seniors building and at least doing a similar reporting and, and line of questioning with those residents. Um, but we do have a bit of information on the most common complaints, right? We have, we have all of those logs and some, some interviews from beforehand. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And again, everyone, I'm trying to keep up with the questions. A lot of great stuff in the chat. We will get to it either now or in the after hour. Um, I had up next uh, Stuart uh, Bridget from New York. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, firstly, great project. Second, I was, I was curious about how the original plan was to go with completely external insulation, but it, uh, despite spalling, and you mentioned a lot of the pull tests and the, the structural tests that were done. Um, would you have proceeded with external just uh, uh, in spite of all of that? Um, and because you mentioned the mold as the critical component that meant for an indoor and external uh, component. So, you know, the spoiling, the damage, et cetera, how would have that been overcome with an external only solution? Uh, good, good question. Um, it's interesting because most of these buildings uh, or 99.9% .9 of these buildings are, are inhabited. So if we're going to be doing retrofits, we have to figure out how do we do it with minimal interference. And so that means that we, we need to work from the exterior. So even though this one wasn't, um, this one was empty, um, our, our initial take was let's work from the outside. And, and also the only reason we did it is because the mold required full remediation and full removal of all the drywall and all the electrical conduits and everything. So there was an enormous expense with that work. So it was really more of a silver lining that we could get some envelope savings. There was still a cost to the project for all of that, for that discovery. Um, so, so I think that wh where the market really needs to go, and there's been lots of conversations about this, is what is the way you do a deep and robust uh, uh, envelope strategy from the exterior? Because what we found is to achieve the design that we did um, required the first layer 
uh, to be to remove thermal bridging through fiberglass supports and um, embracing and then created sheathing and then put ethos on top of that and we did get tender pricing for it which is interesting to sort of compare and we then took that tender pricing and we got alternative pricing from a prefabrication shop to be able to say let's go prefab but the issue is it's not prefab in terms of like you know prefab it's like a bespoke pre-construction which is very different than a off-the-shelf prefab so i think that um innovation in the rapid assembly of affordable uh, cladding systems to get our, you know, our effective R38 is really um, uh, a real place the industry needs to go, as we all know. And I think for a rough, you know, for a reasonable cost, we could go to an owner and say, let's do six inches of, of mineral wall ethos. But to get that, um, to go beyond that uh, is still a real challenge. And it would be difficult uh, to, to argue to go interfit and to get that thickness with today's pricing. So that's, that's something that we really need to, to develop. Uh, Justin, I know you got a couple questions. Fire with one. You can, I'll let you pick which one you want to give. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll follow up on what the point you were just making. Um, so uh, awesome presentation. I uh, was working on a, uh, a retrofit similar to this in New York City. Um, which is being, uh, on, that's under construction right now. Um, and it's the same essential strategy, or uh, ethos on the outside uh, over masonry. And uh, to your point about the way to do this in a rapid way, I was just curious if you tried, if you use any kind of 3D scanning technology and at least, you know, for the initial phase, getting all that information of the existing building in place without having to do any. Uh, actually on site, like heavy, like days on end measuring things? Yeah, uh, re really good question. Uh, we, we did, mm -hmm. yeah, we did do some, um, but yeah. interestingly, we did not use it as much as we thought we would. Um, and that's because of the, um, the methods that we used for the envelope. So EFIS is forgiving, it's not like a panel system, right? Had we used a panel system, that would have come mm -hmm. In, uh, that would have been a requirement. Uh, EFIS is more forgiving. Um, the windows, you know, of course, the rough openings for windows varied, right? The building was built, you know, however it was built. And so uh, the, the approach to install windows on the exterior gave us enough forgiveness on tolerances with window sizing that, again, the 3D scanning didn't we didn't end up meeting it. We had done it when we thought, as Graham mentioned, we might go with a panelized prefab approach. Um, but in the end, it wasn't necessary. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, one just got carried away with the uh, the questions. Uh, I think it's Jake. Sorry, Jake. Uh, Jake Boyer. It might have been more of a statement. Um, I just read it quickly and saw your name. So, Jake, if not, I'm going to skip. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Go ahead and ask your question. Oh, my, my statement was in response to somebody else's question that uh, the in-swing windows certainly present challenges when it uh, comes to, to interior shades. Uh, you need to oversize your rough openings to allow for uh, the shade balances and, and things like that. I, I, I learned that the hard way. and It's a challenge to find shades for uh, in-swing windows. All right. Well, thank you for that. And then we will skip to... Um, Sorry, we'll go to, oh shoot, I know this one was in the hopper and people wanted to get to it. I know Bronwyn commented on, uh, yeah, sorry Bronwyn, sorry to put you on the spot. Do you want to come on and ask your question? Okay, I've had a few things to ask. Yeah, First this of was... all, what are they putting in the water in Hamilton that's making all <laughs> these amazing pets of house buildings happening? <laughs> I want to know, because every city in North America needs that additive. Um, and then the other questions, I had a whole bunch of comments, really, just the mineral wool substrate. Did you guys have to do that um, drainage channel that they're requiring? I don't know whether they've changed this, but the last time I tried to do an EFIS with a mineral wool substrate, they wanted to do this ridiculous scoring, which effectively negates the value of the insulation in my book. So I wanted to hear how did you, did you have to do that? And if not, how did you get around it? Uh, sh Graham, do you want to take this or do you want me? Oh. Okay. Uh, um, so, sure. So, yes, we did. I I'd love to know what they're putting in the water in Hamilton, too. That's a great question. 
Great question. Um, there are other organizations and not just this one doing passive houses in Hamilton. So um, you could say that, you know, as, as, as Monty was saying, when someone starts, others take it up, um, which is really exciting. And similarly, building uh, the building inspectors, the plans examiners, people, uh, people in the municipality are getting trained up. So, and then the contractors follow. So it just takes enough of a critical mass and it's starting to build, but it's still, we're still early and there's still some roadblocks. Um, on the question about drainage, yes, we do have a drainage uh, layer uh, behind the ethos. Um, it's not scored directly into the, um, uh, uh, no, is, is that true? No, it is, it is scored, it is, it basically it's a system at the back end of the mineral wool uh, six inch insulation that actually creates a drainage pattern. Uh, but the depth of that is 10 millimeters, right? So it's not over the six inches, you're taking away just 10 mils and it's only intermittently. I'd love to have some follow up on those systems because this is something I've looked at that is not required in Europe and it's a sort of a fallout okay. from the EFIS legislation the, or the failures which my take on that is that was a building science failure and not a product failure um, so I'd love for more projects to kind of track that and so that we can you know because I'm 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 personally worried that this is going to bite the passive house community in the butt in about 10 years time. And it's, again, it won't be a passive house failure. It's a, it's a building science failure. And I think that solution is something we should all as a community actually track um, and monitor because we're going to need that data in a few years, you know, in a, as I say, well, 10 in years res time. response to that, I, I totally agree. And, um, it really, it's a building code issue in that because of, you know, it's a building code issue, you can't fight it. But when we have our German colleagues come, they're just scratching their heads, like, why would anyone do this? So I, I think it would be really interesting to do um, a mock wall or a mock project where you just use your standard, you know, middle Europe, slap it on mineral wall, plaster wall, and, and there you go. And I think what we've, you know, with this project, it's almost like a higher tech solution to a low tech installation. And that's where there's some additional costs and everything else. So couldn't agree more. All right, everyone. Uh, Betsy, you're next. I saw that coming, but. <laughs> no worries, there's lots in the chatter. I'm trying to keep uh, up too. Graham and Yael, it's uh, you know nice to see this, this project presented as always. Um, um, what, I, what I think it would be really beneficial if you could talk a bit about the, the conclusion that you came to that it would make more financial sense to retrofit rather than replace the building. Um, and then what would that next step to make it high performance, um, how small or big that step was uh, in the relative scheme of things. It's funny how you, it's not like when you're in a room and you can decide who's talking. Um, so, I mean, I'll start. Uh, um, the. We do, because we do retrofits, we have to have this conversation all the time, which is the assumption that tearing something down and building new is cheaper somehow. And um, so we did lots of those evaluations. And um, even though this is a complete asset renewal and we're replacing every electrical conduit and every plumbing riser in the building, um, that we are not building a 18 story concrete frame uh, or the partition walls, and we are not spending up to five million dollars on doing abatement for complete demolition you know so th these are the costs that people don't usually consider uh, in terms of that full piece so um, it's still less than half the cost of, of building new uh, to to the same standard with all the with all the stuff so um, and most of the retrofit work we do that's not as ambitious as a, as a fraction of that um, and then of course there's all the the that's the, the, the dollars and cents but there's also just in an existing building with existing residents there's just the disruption factor so there's the whole there's so many so many reasons right we're preaching to the choir um but the other thing that was really great about the assessment on this one is um we looked at the embedded energy of, of what would happen had they demolished it you know 1960s concrete is highly uh carbon intensive um and then even if you demolished it and built a new passive house, how many centuries would it take until you actually uh, built that budget back from just the, the lost carbon in, in the concrete? So um, I don't have the data on the tip of my tongue, but it was compelling. <laughs> so it's uh, those types of things to, 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 you know, to show your decision makers. Uh, great stuff as always. Um, Jason from Roberts Creek. 
you're up next. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Graham and Yale. Uh, and for Timothy McDonald, I have this uh, background image here uh, to share. Um, uh, my question was about cooling. Uh, Graham, you had mentioned uh, uh, you don't have full, full cooling, but you have some kind of cooling. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on that. Yes, so cooling was the big thing and it came actually half like midstream. So at first the, the client was, wasn't interested in cooling. They just said, you know, it wasn't part of the program. And then they said, you know what, we changed our minds. Um, and, and we, you know, we certainly agreed. And um, uh, I think what's really clever about the solution that was developed is that it does dehumidification and it does, um, uh, whatever the, uh, the most elegant phrase is, it does, it does some cooling. So on a really hot day, it brings it down to a more comfortable level, plus the ceiling fan and plus everything else. But this is when it's gonna be one of the really interesting parts of the study is to say, how does it actually perform? Are people comfortable? It also is a, a seniors building. And so there's gonna be different perceptions of, of comfort you know, with this. Um, and uh, it does have the ability if needed that centrally they could put in a more robust cooling system. So the idea is that let's say it doesn't work. Um, there, there's that fail safe. And we've always heard this disaster of projects that, that, you know, all the modeling tells them they don't need cooling and then everyone puts like AC units in their windows and with duct tape and ruins the passive house. So um, I think the idea that there is a fail safe, um, but the, um, uh, the fact that we're able to have uh, the, the units or most of them have two exposures and we do have quite a bit of air movement with the windows being open um, and the ceiling fans. And so that just on its own will, you know, we're very interested to see how does it play out about perceptions of comfort and then the ability to, you know, close those windows and put on the, um, the central cooling. Did I miss anything, Yao? <laughs> Don't worry, there's there's lots. So uh, we'll come back to it. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I just wanted to just bring up uh, Scott Groves from the city of Surrey. And because he's a client, it's the only question is, how come the city of Surrey went with Passive House? Scott, do you want to just come on and share the client story? Sure. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, I'm actually not with the city of Surrey anymore. I moved on to the city of Coquitlam, but uh, I was there. And uh, yeah, um, as far as the decision making went, it really was my own um, decision. I was not happy with what I'd been seeing. Uh, I was involved in building uh, quite a few buildings, over about a billion dollars worth of construction over the past dozen years. And uh, wasn't happy with seeing the results because I was also in charge of operations. So I started doing a lot of uh, my own study and figuring out what was going to work the best and wanted to try passive hosts. And my boss uh, gave me enough rope to hang myself. And uh, <laughs> that was basically what he said to me too. And uh, I uh, took a chance and I think uh, the results have been absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm really excited to hear about uh, the point zero uh, six. Um, exchange. That's unreal. Well, great stuff, Scott. And again, thank you so much for uh, learning about it and, and having the gusto to get a big long rope and, and hopefully the same will occur in Coquitlam. So bravo. We're very grateful for the, your commitment and this project. And as you can see, I've got, you know, the, the staircase, which looks like, a, yeah. a, a, you know, it looks like a page out of Winnie the Pooh and Melissa Higgs, who and, and the HCMA that did the project. It's just amazing to see come alive. So bravo. Thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to turn over to Zach to give us the updates. Then we'll um, give it over to Monty and then back to Graham. So Zach, you want to take over? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, I, I, we have another great pre presenter next week. Uh, Jonathan Arnold will be presenting about the second in Delaware uh, Paso House Apartments in Kansas City, Missouri. And at least at one point, this is one of the largest, uh, maybe uh, was the largest passive house project. I, I think that's probably not the case now, but it is a very significant apartment building project and um, it delivered it at, at low construction costs. So it should be really interesting to hear about that. And then I also um, wanted to say uh, and celebrate that Passive House Accelerator's uh, one year anniversary is today. And so I Ooh. wanted to, yeah, so I wanted to uh, raise a glass to Michael Ingui for making it happen. Thanks, Michael. Michael. Well Michael. done. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you.
And thanks back bet to Zach and everybody else. Thanks, guys. Yeah, baby. Andy. Woo. Um, well, and thanks to everybody. Thanks for the teams involved with the Clay Community Center in Surrey, uh, Integral, HCMA, the city itself for helping that uh, building come to pass and allowing us to show it. We're looking to touring and bringing people through that building for years and years to years to come. Uh, deep thanks to ERA, to Yale, to Graham, to I know you have some other partners on here. Really exciting project. We hope to be uh, showing that project off even before it's finished as a model of what we can do with deep energy retrofits uh, and look forward to you presenting on it until you can't stand it anymore for the next two or three years. Um, hey, I want to just ask, ask, offer one final note. I am that guy who waits until the last minute to sign up for everything. And usually when I'm going to the North American Pass House Conference, it's now, two weeks before the conference, where I'm like, shoot, I got to buy that plane ticket. You know, I can still get the 14-day advance. And I'm just pointing out, you actually could sign up now. You don't have to wait two more weeks until the morning it starts to sign up. Uh, the registration page is open. The price is going to be the same. The discount is be the same. Pretend you had to buy an air ticket and make your last minute now and register for the NAPHN conference, and you'll be styling two weeks from now when it all starts. Right on. Well, Monty, you thanked everyone under the sun. So I am just <laughs> going to second that. And uh, with that, we will kick off our after hour. Uh, folks are uh, staying for questions that any of you have for both projects, whether the Community Center in Clayton Heights or the Ken Sobel Tower. So hang out with us and uh, find out more. Excellent. Again, thank you, everyone. And for those that, again, uh, have to leave, again, please depart. But uh, Graham, let's turn it back to you to uh, kick off some more great stuff. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. So, um, so this is this is kind of part two. Um, and when we're, we're doing this work, it's within this, this broader context of looking at these buildings as a whole. So I'm just going to do a, a quick run through of, of some of our other work that um, uh, Yale and I work on together, looking at kind of the policy side. And um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, and and one thing I did I did want to I don't know if he's in the audience he said he might be but from from Hamilton um, a, a huge shout out to um, uh, within the city of Hamilton you know the, the they had a new CEO from uh, city housing named Tom Hunter who said like you know said like approve this let's do this but uh, Sean Botham who is the the director of development who really is the, the leader around bringing passive house to, to city housing and his, this, this project wouldn't happen without him so just if he's in the audience thanks very much for that leadership and the the question around what does it take to get to doing a, a deep retrofit project to the audacity to do it and you can compel people with a lot of numbers but really it takes leadership. It takes someone who wants to do it, to take the risk, to, to push it. And so we've seen some of them in the audience today. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it gets easier to take that leadership the more that people do it, but you, you need those leaders. Um, so what we're looking at is that the Ken Sobel Tower is one of thousands of these buildings. And these are all over North America. So within this work and these, net, these networks, you know, conversations we've had with NYCHA and Retrofit New York and BC Housing and, and all sorts of other groups. And of course, all over Europe. I mean, these, these are absolutely ubiquitous throughout, throughout Europe and, and Middle Europe and Germany where this standard all came from. Um, so what this work is looking at is saying, how do we um, uh, make this more ubiquitous? What are the different pieces? Because uh, a lot of retrofit needs to happen. Um, so this is some, some data analytics we've done looking at where are these buildings all over the country. So this is just Canadian data, but they're, they're in every major metropolitan area. So lots in Vancouver and Montreal, uh, but very highly represented in the, the greater Toronto region where there's about 2000 of these sort of post-war apartment towers, um, some private, some, some uh, public, and they're all aging at the same time. And a lot of them are some pretty rough shape. So when we started this work about 10 years ago, advocating for this, um, it was theoretical that some of these buildings may fail, and, but now they're starting to fail. Now you're actually getting critical systems going offline. This building here had to be evacuated in more than a thousand families, um, and they didn't return to their apartment for over 18 months. Um, and so it's getting to the point where there's just the clear resilience of keeping these buildings online is becoming a, a, a real political issue. Um, also during COVID, um, a lot of cases are overrepresented in these buildings. And part of that, you know, may be uh, due to uh, ventilation and other issues like that. So suddenly, how do we, how do we uh, attend to the real, uh, what is the 21st century expectations of this housing? It provided uh, amazing 
20th century housing, but now it's time to, to give it a reboot. So when we look at this as a, as a team, um, it really is how do you deliver housing rehabilitation or, or deep retrofit? Well, you need financing pool, you need standards, and you need a, ret a robust retrofit industry. And how do you build that up? So uh, a lot of this work has been with partners. So a lot of people on this call and, and elsewhere have played, played a huge role. Um, we've developed uh, uh, a group that Yael and I lead called the Tower Renewal Partnership, which is a, a nonprofit where we're able to work with you know, policymakers and, and others to, to push this through and, not, and other nonprofits. And a lot of it has just been like lots of workshops, lots of symposiums, lots of sort of you know, case building. Um, and uh, what was great is that um, you know, with our work and the work of thousands of others, was able to work uh, with the federal government in framing the what they call the National Housing Strategy, which has actually put $15 billion on the table with a commitment to retrofit 200,000 units over the next decade. So that's, that's what Monty's talking about. And that's really to say, okay, how do we distribute those funds and to what standard? Um, and so some of the work that uh, we're working on to contribute to this through the nonprofit and working with CMHC is, is trying to tackle some of these different items really on then the delivery side. So two that we're just wrapping up and we're um, one of them you can actually get now from from our website and the other one we're, we're wrapping up and happy to, to share as soon as it's out. One is looking at just advancing the retrofit industry um, and, and Monty and others participated in this and it's really just saying what's the state of affairs what's missing and how do we expand it and it's really a supply chain issue. What's missing from the marketplace to make this better faster and cheaper. Another one is looking really at the challenge and opportunity of um, doing deep retrofits with residents in place. We're talking about engaging in a you know, 10 to $15 million construction project in a building that has 300 to 400 people in it. You know, it takes a real sense of uh, planning and mobilization and, and care. Um, and so this study is looking at what are those best practices and how do you write your specs and how do you do your procurement to make sure that it works. Um, and a lot of this work has been looking at what is best practice around the world. So we're late to the party here. You know, uh, uh, there's been a lot of this work already happening. This is some slides from the UK um, with this sort of like snap and play sprinkler systems and, and you know, install in one day uh, in the washroom HRVs and these types of products. Um, and so uh, the fun part of this has been uh, going to all these X's and actually, you know, looking at partnerships and working with them. Um, uh, uh, with, with others for best practice. So we sort of codified that and we looked at four case studies, um, some in Germany, some in the UK, some in France, and one in, in BC uh, with BC Housing. Um, and uh, there's sort of, you know, pictures of us on job sites sprinkled around here. But it was, this one was quite amazing because it was looking at who's the construction foreman who actually knows every resident and can actually work uh, in, in this really challenging context but also what are the products that they're using and what are the design decisions that you're making to make sure that you, um, uh, you know, design for ease of installation. Um, so these are, this is a passive house project in Germany, a remarkable one done, done with residents in place. Um, so this is, this is the, what we did at Ken Sobel, but there's some stuff we would have loved to do that we weren't able to do. Um, I think it's interesting, every product we were able to source locally, so nothing was imported. Um, there, there, some of it, you know, it says people use Swagon and other things, but they ha have all local distributors. Um, and, um, and the, being able to use the Canadian windows was, was great. Couldn't have done that a few years ago. Um, but one thing, let's say, could we have kept the balconies? So had we done that, what's the back balcony wrap system? What does that look like? How do you warranty it? How do you, how does it, you know, what, what's that system? The other one is the enclosure. You see these all over the place. They're almost plug and play as a, a company called Balco out of Sweden. Um, and here it's like an import, it's a bespoke measurement, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a unique fabrication and, a, and an affordable project it just can't, can't bear it. So these are some of the things and happy to share this, this work, but all of this looked at what were used on different um, applications and kind of a green, yellow, red in terms of is it available in North America or not? And a lot of the things that would simplify this are just not, um, uh, not here yet and, and maybe, such as ductless, um, uh, ductless fresh air delivery or HRVs and, and those types of things. Um, and then just wrapping up, this is sort of looking at the cycle about how how do we then use this this fantastic public policy, this political will to, to, to deliver a massive amount of retrofits. But when you look at it from, here's the delivery side, you know, public interest creates a public program, which means you've got a capital pool. So then they want to flow that capital pool to a distressed asset so it becomes a, a successful retrofit. Uh, Ken Sobel in the middle of that. But what we needed is a, a, a kind of a, a risk-taking owner who would say, great, I'm gonna sign me up. And then to make sure 
that, that it makes sense for them, like even as a nonprofit owner, what, what's their risk profile? And then what we find the real challenges, and I know a lot of the people here do as well, is that, you know, uh, challenge one, build the business case, build the political will, secure your funding, uh, do your design. But then challenge two is then you can you is the marketplace ready to make this, you know, uh, on time and on budget, you know what I mean? And, and it's almost like they're the last to the party when they should be the first to the party. How are we actually telling the story to industry that there's $15 billion of retrofit construction along the way? And what is the supply chain requirements to get ready so that people like us can spec products that are cheaper? <laughs> you know? So that's, that's part, of, part of what we're, we've been looking at with, with the broader group. The other one is just then, you know, can you then also get there through regulation? So I'd say Vancouver and BC have really led the way, at least in the Canadian context, um, and just, you know, uh, the, the, the anecdote that we've heard is the reason Cascadia could invest who knows how many tens of millions of dollars in a triple glazed window enterprise is because there was a code that gave them certainty that this was a long-term venture. Um, but people aren't able to take that risk if it's just an incentive program, right? So it's uh, the power of codes and how that all works. And then this is just looking at the kind of, you know, potential economic impact. This is mostly local jobs, local employment. Um, you know, so we're looking at billions of dollars as you, as you scale this up. Um, and then sort of nationally looking at uh, if we were able to, to meet a, even a reasonable energy standard for the for this building stock, we could you know remove three uh, three megatons or more from the system. So that's um, how is and what's this? This this is I, I'll skip this one. It's, it's too complicated. All right, that's my spiel, and uh, this is this is the work we do. So that's if you're interested, the Tower Node Partnership. You can check us out online, and um, and thanks very much. <laughs>